Well, good morning or good afternoon, everybody, uh, where you are. I was just uh, holding on as people are joining into the conference, but uh, I think uh, I will start uh, and uh, I can begin, I, I think, by uh, introducing both myself and um, my co-presenter, Tom Montague-Smith. Um, uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, who don't know Chambers and don't know us, this is probably the 10th uh, the uh, of our annual conferences that we've been giving uh, in the region uh, over uh, the last few years. Uh, introducing myself, I have been uh, an arbitration practitioner for some 40 years or so, uh, and throughout that time I've been involved in, in disputes uh, throughout the region. I now split my time as arbitrator uh, and counsel. Uh, I'm a member of the ICC uh, Global Commission and a member of the Court of Arbitration of the Casablanca International Arbitration Centre. Uh, together with my co-presenter uh, this morning or this afternoon, Tom Montague-Smith, we were uh, intimately involved in the creation of the DIFC Courts, although uh, we take no responsibility for the furniture or, or, or the absence of casters on the chairs if you ever acted as an advocate uh, in, in that court. Um, Tom is probably the busiest uh, and perhaps even best known uh, advocate uh, in the DIFC courts uh, and indeed with uh, good reason if anybody reads the guides uh, about his uh, expertise, uh, which is well known to everybody. Uh, in addition to having been involved in uh, particular setting up the Dubai World uh, Tribunal, um, he was involved in helping to create the courts in Astana, where he now sits uh, as a judge. So, uh, as I say, Chambers has been giving these seminars for a long time, and uh, we regard ourselves uh, as probably the major uh, company and commercial set of chambers active in the region. And what we would hope to do today is provide you with some real world practical insights into the arbitration of uh, corporate disputes, uh, particularly by reference to what is going on in the region and in the interaction uh, between arbitral tribunals uh, and the courts. Uh, and as you'll see, we'll deal with a number of different issues. The first one of which is jurisdiction, and that is going to be dealt with by my colleague, um, Arshad Ghaffar. Arshad is a very experienced arbitration practitioner. He's appeared in arbitrations in many jurisdictions, uh, including, of course, Dubai and the DIFC, Muscat, as well as London, India, and indeed Pakistan. Um, he's also spent quite a bit of time in the DIFC courts uh, arguing about uh, arbitration matters, including on some of the earliest of the conduit enforcement cases. And he's been described by the guides as a highly effective barrister with a strong analytical mind. So today he's going to discuss some issues of jurisdiction which arise in uh, company uh, disputes. Uh, and he's had recent experience uh, of that in the DIFC courts in relation to a jurisdictional challenge based on the unenforceability uh, of the award at the place of incorporation uh, of the company as a matter of the law of that place uh, of incorporation. So with that introduction, uh, can I hand over to Arsha to make his presentation? Thank you, Michael, very much for that very generous introduction. Good afternoon, everybody. In the presentations which follow, you will hear about various substantive and legal issues arising in the arbitration of company law disputes. However, the starting point and of foundational importance is the question of jurisdiction of the tribunal over the dispute itself. If the dispute is not arbitrable and the tribunal has no jurisdiction in relation to it, then the arbitral proceedings will be stillborn and relief will have to be sought in some other forum. So, the issue of arbitrability of certain types of company law disputes is a live one and needs to be considered. In each case, one will have to look at the specific legislation on arbitration and on company law in the relevant jurisdiction, that is, the seat of the arbitration, as well as the nature of the claim being advanced, before one can arrive at a conclusion. This will be so even in cases where the place of incorporation of the company in question may, for example, be state X, and as a matter of the law of state acts, 
a tribunal seated in state X would have jurisdiction. The two jurisdictions of particular interest to this audience are the DIFC and onshore Dubai Strip, the UAE generally. Neither the DIFC arbitration law nor the Federal Arbitration Act contain any provisions which expressly limit the jurisdiction of arbitrators. Although the Federal Arbitration Act by Article 4.2 does provide expressly that arbitration is not permitted in matters which do not permit compromise. As to this, Article 7.3.3 of the Civil Code lists seven potentially usurious transactions that are unequivocally not permitted to be the subject matter of a compromise and are so not arbitrable. The most significant of these in the company law context are, firstly, Riba al Nasya, which is usurious interest in consideration of the deferment of the payment of a debt. Secondly, reducing part of a deferred debt owed by a debtor in consideration of accelerating the date of payment. And thirdly, an advance involving a benefit. Any claim involving any of these transactions will not be arbitrable in onshore Dubai generally. Additionally, both the DIFC arbitration law in section 41.2b and the Federal Arbitration Act in Article 53 contain provisions allowing the setting aside of an arbitration award in circumstances where either the subject matter of the dispute is not capable of settlement by arbitration or the award is in conflict with the public policy of the UAE. The requirements of section 41.2b and the question of arbitrability have been considered by the DIFC courts in the case of Gage Investment Limited and Gannel Capital Limited. In Gage, the argument that the subject matter of the dispute was not capable of settlement by arbitration under DIFC law proceeded under two limbs. The first limb focused on the fact that Article 65, 94 and 95 of the DFSA regulatory law expressly contemplated proceedings in, I quote, the court. The second limb was that arbitrating breaches of these provisions would be contrary to the public interest and so also to the public policy of the UAE. In his judgment, Mr Justice Field made extensive reference to the decision of the English Court of Appeal in Fulham Football Club, the facts of which he said were not dissimilar in a general sense to those in the instant case. Having recited those facts, he went on to adopt the approach of Lord Justice Longmore in Fulham Football Club and consider the second question posed by the learned Lord Justice, i.e. Did the relevant statute expressly or impliedly prohibit the reference to arbitration of the matters in question? In this context, he rejected the submission that the reference to the court in the Articles of the Regulatory Law meant that those provisions were to be construed as meaning that only a DIFC court could hear claims for rescission and compensation based on regulatory breaches. He relied on Lord Justice Longmore, Longmore's observation in Fulham Football Club that the fact that a statutory power, which a court would not have at common law, apart from the statutory provision, is given to the court, does not mean that an arbitrator, to whom a dispute is properly agreed to be referred, does not have a similar power. Whilst Mr Justice Field was not concerned with a company law dispute or a claim for unfair prejudice brought by shareholders, his general adoption of the approach taken in Fulham Football Club, as well as his finding that both the English Arbitration Act 1996 and the DIFC Arbitration Law of 2008 were informed by the same underlying policy of giving effect to party autonomy, suggests that the Fulham Football Club case, in which it was held that a claim for unfair prejudice under Section 994 of the English Companies Act was arbitrable, has a strong precedential value in the DIFC courts. I turn then to the question of public policy. The question arises as to what actually is the public policy of the UAE. The Civil Code addresses public policy in Article 3. This states, public policy shall be deemed to include matters relating to personal status, such as marriage, inheritance and lineage, and matters relating to systems of government, freedom of trade, circulation of wealth, rules of individual ownership, and the other rules and foundations upon which society is based, in such a manner as to not conflict with the definitive provisions and fundamental principles of Islamic Sharia. The judgment of the Abu Dhabi Court of Cassation in Commercial Appeal 663 of 2012 further establishes that public policy is a set of guidelines for taking decisions and pursuing actions that are a fundamental concern to society and that where a mandatory rule of law does not relate to public policy within this meaning, 
or its purpose is the protection of private rights and interests, there is no justification for invoking a public policy exception. Engaged in Gunnell, Mr. Justice Field dealt with the public policy argument shortly. He said, I have given careful consideration to whether the award is in conflict with the public policy of the UAE. In my judgment, the award is not in conflict with UAE public policy. The award is not in conflict with the rules and foundations upon which society is based. I turn now to consider some of the conflicts of law issues that can arise when the seat of the arbitration is different from the place of incorporation of the company. The general conflicts of law rule is that a company is domiciled in its place of incorporation and the law of the place of incorporation governs all matters concerning the constitution of the company. Our arbitrators, faced with disputes about matters concerning the constitution of a company, including, for example, matters concerning its internal management, permitted to exercise jurisdiction, and if so, are they permitted to apply the law of the place of incorporation, absent any provision, express provision for them to do so in the arbitration agreement? In cases involving the internal management of a foreign corporation, a court will usually give considerable weight to the courts of the place of incorporation as being the appropriate forum. Equally, the law of the place of incorporation, as the applicable law, determines a, vari a variety of questions, including the composition and powers of the various organs of the corporation, whether directors have been validly incorporated, the nature and extent of the duties owed by the directors to the corporation, who are the corporation's officials authorized to act on its behalf, the extent of an individual's member's liabilities for the debts or engagements of the corporation, the ability of the corporation to make a distribution to its members, the validity of a transfer of assets and liabilities by way of universal succession or amalgamation with another corporation, and the rights of a shareholder to bring a derivative action in respect of wrongs done to a corporation, which in cases containing a foreign element is a matter of substance and not procedure and is governed accordingly by the law of the place of incorporation. So if the arbitration agreement purports to confer jurisdiction to deal with issues concerning the constitution of the company without making any express reference to or even expressly seeking expressly to displace the law of the place of incorporation, it will arguably be ineffective to do so and cannot confer any jurisdiction on the arbitrators in that regard. Take, for example, the DIFC LCI arbitration, which is made subject to English governing law in relation to a company incorporated in Oman. Does the arbitrator have any jurisdiction to apply Omani company law? If the matter in dispute cannot be determined absent an application of this law, because it concerns the constitution of the company, then arguably the arbitrator has no jurisdiction in relation to that matter and it is inarbitrable. Finally, I want to make some points about relief and enforceability. I won't say too much about these topics as they're being dealt with by another speaker. However, in the context of arbitrability, it should be borne in mind that the fact that the arbitrators may not be in a position to order all the relief that a court can does not render the dispute inarbitrable. In many cases, the relief sought is declaratory in any case, so the question of specific remedies does not arise. So far as concerns the enforceability of the award, Muscle and Boyd on commercial arbitration draws a connection between arbitrability and enforceability and states that any dispute or claim concerning legal rights which can be subject to an enforceable award is capable of being settled by arbitration. A question that arises concerns the case where any award can only be enforced in the place of incorporation and requires regulatory approval or conduct before this can be done. Is this an issue that goes to the jurisdiction of the tribunal stroke of arbitrability of the dispute, or is it limited solely to the enforcement of the award? In conclusion, issues of arbitrability and jurisdiction are too often ignored or treated as being matters of last resort. However, they are important and, in the context of claims involving companies, should be properly considered at the outset. This is particularly so in those cases where the seat of the arbitration differs from the place of incorporation of the company in question in respect of which some difficult questions can arise. Thank you all very much. Well, thank you very much indeed, Ashed. And uh, I, I have a question for you arising out of there, which is, uh, I, I hope, a very uh, very practical one. But, but what do you do if you want to obtain a remedy which only the court can give? For example, if you want the court to use its powers to set aside a transaction, where do you begin? 
Well, Michael, the answer to that is really found in the recent English Court of Appeal decision in Bridgehouse and BAE Systems Limited. And in that case, the issue was regarding provisions of the Companies Act concerning restoration of a company to the register and associated relief. And Lord Justice Newey quoted Sundaresh Menon, Chief Justice Sundaresh Menon in the Singapore Companies Court, where he said, conceptually, there is nothing to preclude the underlying dispute from being resolved by an arbitral tribunal, with the parties remaining free to apply to the court for the grant of any specific relief, which might be beyond the power of the arbitral tribunal to award. Insofar as any findings have been made in the arbitration in such a case, the parties would be bound by such findings and would, at least as a general rule, be prevented from relitigating those matters before the court. So whether you go to the court first, in which case the court proceedings will be stayed for the arbitration, having granted the remedy, or you go to the arbitral tribunal first, and then in the course of the arbitration, make an application to the court for the, the remedy that the, the arbitral tribunal cannot order. The position is much the same. As long as you're not relitigating issues that have already been decided, so you have issues of questions of issue estoppel and raised judicata that will arise, which will give rise to procedural complexity. The procedural complexity is not enough to make the dispute inarbitrable. As Sundaresh Menon said, to put it simply, procedural difficulties fall short of the statutory criterion for non-arbitrability, which is a finding that to enforce the obligation to enforce the obligation to arbitrate would be contrary to public policy in view of the subject matter of the dispute in question. So I hope that answers your question, Michael. Yeah, I think, can I, can I, even at the risk of oversimplifying it, put it this way, that the arbitral tribunal is the fact-finding tribunal, and that will bind the parties, even if they have to go subsequently to court for relief that only the court will give. Is that a, is that a fair summary? I think that is a fair summary, but if you start off going to court first, Obviously, the court will have to make certain findings of fact before it can grant any relief. And those facts will bind the arbitral tribunal in any subsequent arbitration. But the court proceedings will be stayed for the purpose of that arbitral proceeding to commence and to continue. Okay, well, thank you. That's really interesting. And thank you very much indeed, Asha. Um, just for the benefit of the audience, I should say this. Obviously, um, Asha has been citing a number of authorities um, please don't worry about that. This is being recorded. You can have the recording. So you will have a record of the authorities that uh, Arshad refers to and indeed the other speakers uh, are going to refer to. Plus, uh, if you have uh, any questions um, in terms of timing, please do put them on the chat function and we promise we'll get back to you uh, afterwards uh, with, I, I hope, an answer <laughs> to uh, the question that you're asking. So I mean, with that, can I turn to uh, the contribution today from um, Tom Stuart Coates, uh, who is uh, one of the rising stars in Chambers. Uh, he deals with a wide range of disputes in commercial sphere, uh, including company and insolvency law. And he's appeared in arbitration and court proceedings in a number of different jurisdictions, uh, including, of course, the DIFC. And he's been identified by the guides as a rising star uh, and is said to have an exceptional knowledge of law and an impressive level of expertise. Uh, he is going to uh, speak about issues of corporate control, and that's something that he has very recently uh, worked upon together with Tom Montague Smith in the DIFC court. Uh, Tom, please. Thank you very much, Michael. So I should now be sharing um, some slides. Um, I'll be talking to get today about an issue that seems to arise surprisingly commonly in practice, uh, which has potentially very serious implications for uh, legal representatives, uh, but concerning which there is a surprising dearth of authority and practical guidance. The issue is what happens if there is a dispute over control of a company and that dispute extends to whether to bring or defend arbitration proceedings and who gets to act for the company in any such proceedings. I'll briefly set out a factual scenario uh, which will hopefully help illustrate the issues 
that you have a company in which authority to act for the company is in dispute, whether that's a dispute between competing camps of directors or between shareholders and the board or between the company's board and an insolvency practitioner that has been appointed in respect to the company in one or more jurisdictions. In this scenario, the company either has a claim against or is the subject of a claim by a third party. The competing camps within the company have different views about whether or not the claim should be pursued or defended. So turning now to the bases for authority to commence or defend an arbitration on the company's behalf, this is essentially a matter for the company law regime governing the company's affairs and may differ significantly from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. There may, for example, be default or mandatory rules in either statute or case law that govern by whom and how an arbitration can be commenced or defended on the company's behalf. More frequently, one looks at the company's articles of association or equivalent document, which will usually grant some organ of the company, most often a quorum of its board of directors, the power to bring or defend arbitration proceedings. Sometimes a company may have granted a person uh, or persons a power of attorney to commence or defend proceedings. And finally, if insolvency proceedings have been brought in respect of a company in one or more jurisdictions, there might be a liquidator or similar office holder who's entitled in some circumstances and in some jurisdictions to bring or defend proceedings in lieu of the company's director or directors. Um, so how then does a, a legal representative derive his or her authority to represent a company in arbitral proceedings? Often, of course, a power of attorney will be given, accompanied by varying levels of formality, sometimes written instructions by way of engagement letter or similar, signed by a representative of the company on behalf of the company, uh, will suffice. Uh, law firms will, of course, almost invariably do some form of due diligence on their prospective clients, including consideration of the authority of those purporting to act for the company. But that may well not extend to a detailed analysis of the authority of those purporting to act for the company under one or more potentially applicable systems of company law or, or perhaps agency, at least where there are no clear causes for concern, uh, such as evidence of a dispute about authority. So now on to some potential challenges to the authority of a person or persons who are purporting to bring or defend an arbitration on the company's behalf. First, it may be that under the relevant company law rules, whether that's the articles or any default or mandatory rules of the company's seat or place of incorporation, a particular person or organ must authorise the bringing or defending of proceedings, and that has not happened in this case. Second, those purporting to represent the company may be relying on a defective or rescinded power of attorney. Third, there may be challenges to the entitlement of a person appointed uh, pursuant to insolvency procedures to represent the company. Uh, and finally, a, a particularly extreme, albeit not unheard of example, is where a fraudster or, or similar has simply manufactured or forged the relevant documents, uh, i.e. Uh, when looked at properly, there is no even prima facie claim uh, to authority. Uh, who then has standing to complain about the disputed authority of those purporting to act for the company? The persons with the most obvious interest are those who assert a competing claim to control of the company. And I'll come on in a moment to the forum or forums in which any such complaint might be made. But I don't think there can be any serious argument that where there is a reasonable claim that the purported authority is defective, the competing claimant to control of the company is entitled to have uh, its claim to control heard somewhere relatively expeditiously. Second, the other side in the arbitration uh, might wish to raise a challenge to the authority of those purporting to act for the company. Now, this could simply be a matter of mischief making uh, and part of a, a fairly robust litigation strategy uh, to wrong foot the other side and its legal representatives, but they exist very good and legitimate reasons for the other party to complain. Uh, they may be concerned about the enforceability of any award rendered against the company if it turns out its representation was not properly authorised. They may feel with good justification that a different and more reasonable approach to the arbitration would be taken by the competing claimant to control of the company. Uh, they may want to avoid the company's assets against which they would uh, presumably hope to enforce in due course uh, being squandered on unauthorised representatives. Finally, the tribunal itself may wish to raise the issue if it gets wind of a potential dispute pursuant to its duties to ensure a fair procedure 
and to render an enforceable award in due course. So we've looked at what challenges could be made and by whom such challenges could be raised. An equally important question uh, touched on um, by Arshad is where and how a challenge could be made. As always, the first forum to consider, at least, should be the tribunal. The tribunal may have a range of powers to ensure that the fairness of the proceedings or the enforceability uh, of its war award are not imperiled. Uh, I'll come on to some practical examples uh, in due course. Uh, second, the party making the challenge might look to the court with supervisory jurisdiction over the arbitration. It might, for example, seek orders to restrain the impostors or their legal representatives from acting or orders preserving the assets of the company or some sort of declaratory relief. Third, steps could be taken in the jurisdiction where the company was incorporated or has its seat. Uh, orders could be sought from that jurisdiction declaring the true position under the company law of that jurisdiction or in personam orders potentially could be sought restraining uh, the imposter directors or representatives or, or, or legal representatives of the companies from taking certain steps in relation to the company, including acting in the arbitration. So turning then uh, to the position of legal representatives, this sort of situation uh, can be particularly tricky and uncomfortable uh, for uh, uh, us to navigate as legal representatives. Uh, risks to law firms include the possibility of claims under what's known in common law jurisdictions as the implied warranty of authority that the law firm is deemed to make to the other side that it's properly authorised to act. Uh, this is in many respects a problematic concept, but there are certainly examples in England of substantial monetary awards being made against solicitors pursuant to this doctrine. Uh, law firms might also expose themselves to adverse costs orders, potentially from the tribunal, but also from supervisory courts. Uh, they may find themselves on the receiving end of an application for an injunction seeking to restrain them from purporting to act for the company. The potential basis for such an injunction will vary, uh, but it could include um, the inherent or implied jurisdiction of many courts to supervise the conduct of advocates appearing before it. Uh, finally, there are examples of freezing orders uh, being sought and obtained over funds paid on behalf of a company into its uh, purported solicitor's client account. Uh, then issues for the tribunal and, and the relevant arbitral institution. Uh, uh, they must bear in mind, uh, particularly where there are notice of a dispute over control, uh, could include duties to ensure fair procedure and to render an enforceable award in due course, uh, which of two or more competing legal teams to hear from, and the potentially unauthorised payment of costs and fees uh, to the institution and the tribunal out of company funds. Uh, uh, finally, um, some practical uh, solutions uh, to assist in breaking the deadlock, or at least to avoid uh, prejudicing the company's interests while uh, deadlock over control remains. Uh, interestingly, many of these solutions come from the realm of uh, arbitration or litigation involving states and governments, and in particular recent disputes concerning who's entitled to act for countries such as Libya and Venezuela, where there are competing claimants to be the governments thereof. Uh, one solution, if the two competing claimants to control have mutually compatible cases before the tribunal, uh, is to receive submissions from both sides. Uh, that approach has been taken by tri tribunals in some of the Venezuela cases and may well work if the cases are very similar. Plainly cannot work if, for example, one party wants to vigorously defend the arbitration and the other claimant to control seeks to throw in the towel. Second solution is to stay the arbitration until a satisfactory resolution of dispute over control can be achieved, whether in the courts of the seat of the arbitration or in the courts of the company's seat. Uh, this is in effect what happened in, in one of the Venezuelan cases, albeit in a the, in the quite different context uh, thereof. Um, and, and a third solution would be uh, to appoint or perhaps um, uh, more likely recognise the appointment of a neutral receiver uh, to manage the company's conduct of the arbitration pending resolution over who gets to run its affairs. Um, it's questionable um, at best whether a tribunal would have jurisdiction to make such an order but it should be possible for the courts in, in, in some jurisdictions to do so. And indeed, the, the English courts, at least, have, have, have indicated a willingness to do so, um, particularly in recent litigation involving the Lit uh, Libyan Investment Authority, uh, albeit in the context of substantive proceedings in the English High Court rather than in arbitration. Uh, now, if I could turn back to um, Michael and uh, Tom. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Tom. But, uh, I have one question for you. Uh, if uh, uh, we could return the screen, <laughs> thank you, Sue. Ah. Yes, I thank you very much. Indeed. That's okay. But I, 
I mean, the, the practice in the, the UAE has always been to rely upon the powers of attorney that um, uh, that, that advocates produce. Uh, and you know, one does it as a matter, of, of course, if one's sitting and included in, in the terms of reference. But um, are you saying that, in fact, even if as an arbitrator I have before me uh, someone who produces a power of attorney on the face of it stamped or uh, with the company's stamp and so on, and another team turns up uh, with this power of attorney uh, granted by uh, another set of, of, for example, directors, uh, the power of attorney is not conclusive on the issue. I think, I think the practical answer in most cases is, is that, of course, the, the power of attorney appropriately sealed uh, will be sufficient for arbitrator and, and, and certainly for the, for the relevant law firm. But in, in your scenario, I, I think it's very unlikely to be conclusive of the position. Um, and, and that will depend on the company law rules of the place of incorporation or the place of the seat. I um, mean, it's potentially quite a tricky question. Um, and I think really, realistically, the only solution in those circumstances, and potentially it's a solution that would be of benefit to all parties and the tribunal, is to grasp the nettle at that point and, and see um, how exactly this issue over control can be determined expeditiously, whether it can be done by the tribunal, whether it must be done by uh, the courts of another jurisdiction, and, and get on and decide that dispute. So I, th I think the simple answer is, Usually, in practice, it will be uh, sufficient, but it's certainly not going to be conclusive, particularly when you have competing claimants, as, as in your scenario. Well, thank you for that. It's not the most satisfactory solution, <laughs> and, uh, and it's a nightmare scenario, but, but, uh, but I'm, I'm grateful for your insights on that. Thank you. Thanks very much, Tom, for that. That's um, a really interesting topic and one that I've certainly seen in practice. Um, our next speaker, uh, is Stephen Thompson QC, who will be known to uh, many of you. Uh, he's a commercial chancery barrister uh, and his practice includes a focus on these sorts of issues, company and joint venture disputes. Uh, and he's also particularly known, uh, I think, for his aviation work. But he's got long experience in this region and particularly in the DIFC courts, where we've appeared against each other on quite a number of occasions, particularly in the, in the early days of arbitration enforcement. Um, and he appears uh, regularly in arbitration in Dubai, uh, London, uh, and also in the Far East, and he sits as an arbitrator as well. Uh, the guides uh, just say that he is, quotes, brilliant. Um, so I'll, I'll let you be the judge of that. But um, Stephen is going to speak about what's really a really important area, um, one that's been developing recently, uh, which is this, this tricky question uh, of reflective loss. So I'll hand over to Stephen to, to tell you all about that. Uh, thank you very much, Tom. Uh, yes, this, in this talk about uh, reflective loss, I'm going to refer to five cases, two from the 19th century, one from 1981, one from the turn of the millennium, and one decided in July of this year. Uh, the two 19th century cases just set the background. The first is Foss and Harb bottle, uh, a case decided in 1843, uh, which is authority for the proposition that the proper plaintiff in an action in respect of a wrong alleged to be done to a corporation is prima facie the corporation. Pretty trite stuff, you might think. Uh, but the second limb uh, decided in that case is that no individual member of a company is allowed to maintain an action in respect of a wrong suffered by a company. It really is just a rule to make sure that the right entity sues. Uh, there is one important exception um, in the form of the derivative action, which Liz Weaver and Ed Knight will be talking about immediately after this talk. The rule in Foss and Harbottle is absolutely fundamental to company law. Um, it's as important as the maybe more famous rule in Salomon and Salomon, uh, which famously definitively established the concept of independent legal personality for a corporation. Um, but Foss predates Salomon and Salomon by more than half a century. Um, those are the 19th century cases. This talk, however, is about reflective loss. That principle, uh, if principle it be, is much newer. It's been justified as ensuring that the rule in Foss and Harbottle isn't circumvented. Uh, the rule is this, where a company suffers actionable loss at the hands of a wrongdoer, and that loss results in the fall in value of shares, that fall in the share value is not a loss which the law recognises as being separate and distinct from the loss sustained by the company. 
And that means that if a shareholder uh, has a distinct cause of action against the same wrongdoer, a cause of action that she might pursue against the wrongdoer, she cannot advance her claim in parallel or, e or, or, or certainly not in exclusion to the claim that the company might have. It's important to note the limits of this rule. It doesn't apply where the company has no cause of action at all, and it doesn't apply where the shareholder holders losses are distinct and separate from those suffered by the company. This concept, this rule of law, um, derives from three pages of what's actually a very lengthy, apparently read out Court of Appeal decision in Prudential and Newman in 1981. Uh, but the rule was expanded um, uh, after being considered in a little bit, but not a lot of depth, by the House of Lords in uh, part only of the case of Johnson and Gore Wood in December 2000. Uh, after December 2000, the concept developed rapidly. Some have described it like Japanese knotweed uh, until it fell to be critically examined and drastically pruned in Marix and Sevilleca by a seven member Supreme Court, uh, a case heard in May 2019, but only decided and, uh, in a judgment handed down in July of this year. Now, a, a key element of the rule, as you might have gleaned, is that the uh, loss suffered by the company it, it must be conceptually the same, that is to say, not separate and distinct from that suffered by the shareholder. That is the basis of, of the rule. And that concept can be illustrated by this example. Uh, imagine if a wrong is suffered by a company, but it's remedied immediately thereafter, and the company makes a complete recovery. In those circumstances, the company would not have suffered any significant loss if it recovers immediately afterwards, but nor would the shareholder. The recovery to the company would resolve the shareholders and the company's claims and make them both whole. Turning then to Johnson and Gorewood, this rule was expanded uh, most famously by Lord Millet's speech in Johnson and Gorewood. Lord Millet gave a couple of other justifications for the rule. He said there's a causation rule here. If the company chooses not to sue, or if it does sue and then settles for an embarrassingly low sum of money, then the shareholder's loss would be caused by the company's decisions or its inaction. Uh, but that, we can say with hindsight, is fallacious, as the company might not have had a real choice, for example, if the company had been impecunious. Uh, 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 and in fact, a fortiori, if the company had been left impecunious by the wrongdoer's actions. Another justification Lord Millet gave was the potential conflicts of interest which might arise between companies and their directors. If the directors were also shareholders, as often the case in small companies, uh, there will be a conflict between the company's uh, entitlement to recover the money to sue for it and the director's wish to do so for his own pocket as a shareholder. But of course, the fallacy of that logic is that it doesn't apply for all shareholders, whereas the rule does. Now, Lord Millet's logic that led in the years after 2000 uh, to a series of cases which concluded that the rule against reflective loss should bar all the claims of not just shareholders but also uh, creditors and employees and anybody else who might have a loss that isn't distinct and separate from that of, of the company. The justification and the rationale behind Lord Millet's logic being one that applies equally to them as it does to shareholders. Now, again, with the benefit of hindsight, we can say uh, there were two latent difficulties, at least two latent difficulties, with the decision in, in, in Johnson and Gore Wood. The first is there's no clear majority decision in, in that case. It's very hard to discern from the five distinct speeches what the actual ratio of the decision is. Uh, in the last two decades, it has really been the case that Lord Millet ha uh, and his speech has been held to be the most authoritative uh, uh, ratio of that decision. Now, Lord Millet was, of course, a very highly regarded company lawyer and judge who expressed himself in this case, like all his others, extremely clearly uh, and expansively. Uh, and his, it's his views that then held sway in England and Wales and around the common law world in this area of company law. But since 2000, uh, there have been wrinkles or cracks that have uh, uh, appeared in the principle uh, because it doesn't always uh, result in justice. Uh, and the result has been that although the cases have widened the rule, they've also sought to tease out an exception, such as an exception where the company is left impecunious by reason of the very wrongdoing of the defendant in, in question. And that's said to be, that was said to be an exception. 
But the Supreme Court in 2020 has now told us that the whole premise of Lord Millet's logic is flawed. In particular, they explain that the simple example, which I posited earlier, about immediate recovery for a company after wrongdoing is, is not one from the real world. In the real world, the value of a share is not simply the net asset value of a company divided by the number of shares. It's never the case in relation to a large or a public company. The value of a share depends on its anticipated future prospects, the hope of distributions, uh, or market sentiment, or some combination of those things. And what about the scenario where a company, properly advised in good faith, simply decides not to pursue the wrongdoer, or, or it does pursue him and then settles uh, for its own uh, uh, commercial reasons, or, or it doesn't have sufficient funds to pursue the wrongdoer by reasons of the action of the wrongdoer or otherwise, uh, by reason of insolvency or just uh, not having enough to pay expensive lawyers. Now, if the shareholder decided in those, any of those circumstances to sue the wrongdoer, there could be no possible risk of usurping the company's entitlement and there's no risk of double recovery. So Lord Millet's justifications don't support those, the logic applying in those positions either. Uh, but in Marix and Sevillecca, uh, the sort of Supreme Court said that the rule should survive, albeit somewhat pruned, only to apply to shareholders. Why, in those circumstances, should the law prevent the shareholder from suing on her personal claim? Well, according to the Supreme Court in Marix, the law should do so because the shareholder thrown her lot in with the company and so she must be said to be bound by the constitution and the decisions of the proper organs of the company uh, save as I say in the case of a derivative action which uh, Liz and Ed will follow on after me. Now uh, to allow a shareholder then to pursue her own claim could interfere with the company's management of, of its rights and its claims uh, and, and potentially reduce or uh, damage the company's prospects of recovery from the impecunious from an impecunious wrongdoer. And it avoids the sort of mad scramble uh, that might uh, exist in a, a near insolvency situation. It's also, the, uh, uh, the Supreme Court said, uh, nice to have a bright line legal rule, a principle that avoids complexities and problems uh, and doesn't trouble uh, difficult lawyers like us that might be confused by the difficulty of proliferation of claims or multiple case, case managements. Um, so in Marex, Lord Reed, given the decision of three of the seven judges, concluded that the ratio of Johnson is actually to be found in Lord Bingham's speech, which he concluded was consistent with and no wider than the Court of Appeal decision in Prudential and Newman. And he said, the basis for the rule is a shareholder has entrusted the management of the company's right of action to its decision-making organs, including ultimately a majority of members in a general meeting. Uh, and he added the company's control over its own course of action would be compromised and the rule in Foss and Harbottle could be circumvented if a shareholder could bring a personal action for fall in share value consequent on the company's loss, where the company had a concurrent right of action in respect of its loss. Now, Lady Black and Lord Lloyd-Jones agreed with Lord Reid uh, and Lord Hodge gave a short concurring decision, uh, emphasising that this was a company law rule supported by the desirability of having a bright line legal rule. He relied on tradition. The rule's been around, he pointed out, for some or nearly 39 years uh, since Prudential and Newman and had been upheld as those four judges read it by the House of Lords in Johnson and Gorewood and adopted in many common law countries around the world, although notably not New Zealand. So Marix then clarified that the shareholder is the only category of person caught by this bright line rule and shareholders have other remedies, as Liz and Ed will point out. Now, if you're bored or short of time, as I am, it's the important point to take away from this talk, except three of the seven judges in the Supreme Court didn't agree with this logic. Lord Sales gave his own lengthy judgment and Baroness Hale and Lord Kitchen agreed with him. So that's the two Chancery judges and the President of the Supreme Court not agreeing with the majority. Uh, they agreed, it must be stressed, in the outcome of the particular decision, which was a case about a creditor. Uh, the claim by the creditor was not barred in that case. But Lord Sale said there was no rule set down by Prudential and Newman, which was just a decision on its facts. And he analysed the Court of Appeal decision in depth on this point. Uh, it's noteworthy that the Prudential decision, when it came to the Court of Appeal, had the two allegedly wrong doing directors acting in person. Uh, they previously instructed Richard, later Lord Scott, which may have exhausted their resources. And Lord Sales pointed out that in Johnson, there's no clear ratio. So Lord Sales concluded there is no such rule 
ruled against reflective loss. And furthermore, there shouldn't be. There was no justification for it because it has the effect of barring a person with a perfectly good cause of action from pursuing it. And you need a strong policy reason for the courts to shut out justice and access to justice like that. Lord Sales considered that if there was any mischief in a risk of double recovery, or a mad scramble that could be managed on a case-by-case -case basis if and when it arose. Now there's logic to Lord Sales's position but it isn't the law and we might have to wait another 20 or 40 or 180 years for the matter to come back to be decided by the Supreme Court again and in the meantime for legal advisors all we can say is that we really must carefully scrutinise the particular claims, the duties, the breaches and the losses of our potential clients in each particular case uh, as well as simple contractual claims we need to look at duties owed to and by third parties, consider the insolvency aspects of any case, potential fiduciary duties and breaches of thereof, cross-border obstacles and economic torts, uh, as well as ways of piercing the corporate veil if the contractual claim doesn't work. Imagination will be required. But given the market volatility and the likely economic troubles that we're all going to face in the next few years, I'm sure we'll all be busy. Thank you very much, Michael and Tom. Thank you very much, Stephen. That's uh, it's a it's a fascinating area um, and one that divides opinion, I think. But you you mentioned one thing. I wondered if I could just ask you this. You just talking. You just mentioned the cross border elements that might come into play, uh, and it occurs to me that um, you, you've explained the position certainly as regards English law. But but what if you're dealing with a foreign company? Do the, do the same principles apply? It's it's a very interesting question, Tom, um, because the the rationale for the rule, as explained by Lord Reid, is based upon the constitution of the company, um, which obviously is found in its Articles of Association uh, and the statutory framework, as Asha pointed out, in the company in the in the place of incorporation of the company. And that obviously could be different. Uh, and as you'll know better than me, uh, when the case has come up in the DIFC, in, in Nest and, and Deloitte and Touche, uh, it was raised as a question of, of Lebanese law. It was raised on a strikeout immediate judgment point, and, uh, and Mr Justice Giles uh, very skillfully sidestepped the question. Um, but with the benefit of hindsight, we can see that maybe he was right to do so because the questions would be governed by the Lebanese company law and not uh, the DIFC or any other uh, company law. So uh, on the basis of the logic, um, it, it will be critically important to work out what the rights of a shareholder are under the, the law of incorporation of the company. Having, uh, and it's worth pointing out that in Marix, the companies were BVI companies, but the court didn't avert to that, um, although it's fair to say BVI companies operate very much like English companies. Uh, but in principle, that should be considered in, in each and every case. It's not something especially touched upon by the Supreme Court, uh, but, but it seems to me that is something that, that will have to be considered whenever the question of effective loss arises. Yeah, I, I, well, I agree with that. Sorry. Sorry, I was just going to ask a question, um, if, if I may that uh, about the application in other jurisdictions but but um, Stephen doesn't this issue actually arise out of the very concept of corporate personality uh, in a sense doesn't matter what the rights are under uh, individual law if you have a corporate body which has separate legal personality from its shareholders this point is bound to arise isn't it well, um, it, one would have thought so, but we don't want to be parochial, Michael. I mean, I, I, <laughs> I, I can tell you, broadly speaking, how companies operate in a handful of common law jurisdictions, but I, I wouldn't be able to tell you about companies in Saudi Arabia uh, or Lesotho. So uh, w w one should be careful, I think, to, to, to assume that the company laws runs the same way. And as I pointed out in my talk, the idea of separate corporate personality, which strikes us as being basic to company law, was only established in 1897, whereas companies have been around for hundreds hundreds of years before that. So um, you're probably right, um, but uh, it might be worth checking with a local lawyer before we jump to that conclusion, particularly if we're trying to argue against the rule of reflective <laughs> loss on behalf of our clients. Yeah. Not, not, not a matter for immediate judgment. Let's put it that way, Michael. Yes, and I, I suppose it's also the case, as you mentioned, that um, while there's general uh, consistency of views through the com Commonwealth, it's, it's not universal. Different views yeah. have been taken. And even in the Supreme Court, as you say, different different views have been, have been taken. So even if you're dealing with a, a foreign company in a common law jurisdiction, it, 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 we see the logic. I agree. Um, but not everyone does. Anyway, yes, I'd love to talk more sorry, about this, I, but I, I'm going to have to um, move on. I right think, to the next speaker. Thank but you. Thank you very much. That's a really interesting topic. Um, and and we, we will move on to our, our next speakers. Uh, and we have a double act now. Um, 
First, we've got Elizabeth Weaver, who again, I think um, many of you will already know. Um, she has a, a, a pretty broad uh, commercial practice, but she does include a focus on these sorts of issues as well, company law, uh, and also on insolvency. So she has that perspective. Um, she has lots of experience in arbitration too, uh, under lots of different uh, rules, uh, which include uh, the DIFC, and I know that well because we've acted together on at least uh, one uh, disputes uh, in the DIFC, both in the courts and in arbitration, uh, amongst other things that we've done together. Um, she is uh, recognised in the guide in, guides in, in a number of areas, um, and she also uh, is described uh, quite shortly in the guides as just brilliant, uh, which I can endorse. Um, but she, she and she also actually appeared in the leading in English case on derivative claims, which is uh, the next topic on which she's going to be. Uh, speaking and she's speaking with Edward Knight uh, and Edward uh, focuses also on commercial company and insolvency disputes uh, and he appears both in litigation and arbitration uh, and he's appeared in arbitration throughout Dubai uh, including under DIAC rules, DIFC, LCI rules and in the DIFC courts uh, and he, he he's also uh, appeared in, in a number of cases involving uh, arbitration in the courts, both in England and the DIFC, including a case, I think, which most people will know about called the IPCO case uh, in the Supreme Court, which he appeared in with Michael. Uh, he, the guides say that he uh, has the intellectual clout to intimidate most opponents. Uh, and, and he's also said to be a formidable uh, cross-examiner. So I'm going to hand over to uh, Elizabeth and Edward to, to talk about this next topic. I think Liz is still muted. Yes, my, my brilliance doesn't extend to being able to operate the, te operate the technology. Um, as has been extensively trailed, Edward and I are going to look at derivative claims and, and issues relating to their arbitration. Um, I'm going to start with a quick recap of the nature of the claims to explain why there may be issues about arbitrability. Um, and as is a common theme, I think, in some of the talks that we've, we've heard, the starting point is to look at the cause of action. If you're acting for a dissatisfied shareholder, let's say in a joint venture that's not working, what are the claims available? Now, there may be a direct contractual claim against other shareholders for a breach of a shareholder's agreement. That obviously can be determined by arbitration if there's a suitable agreement. But if your problem is at the level of the joint venture company, so let's say you've got wrongdoing by the majority shareholders and nominated directors, an attempt by the shareholder to bring a claim directly against the company or against the, those directors is going to run into problems if the joint venture company is incorporated in a jurisdiction which adopts the majority principle of company law, um, as, all com as all common law jurisdictions do. Um, this is the rule in Foss and Harbottle, um, which Stephen has already mentioned. Um, and as I say, recognised um, in all common law jurisdictions in the DIFC as long ago as 2007 in the Dutch Equity Partners in Demand case. Um, and because it's centrally important, um, I'm just going to spend a moment expanding on what Stephen said about the rule. Um, it's built on four planks. First, a company is a separate legal entity distinct from its shareholders. Secondly, the directors owe their duties to the company, not to the shareholders, and not to any third parties such as lenders. So if there has been a breach by a director, that's a breach of a duty owed to the company, so it's a company asset. So it's the company and only the company who is the proper person to pursue that claim. Um, and the decision whether or not to pursue it is in the hands of the board of directors, as Tom uh, Stuart Coates has already explained, or if the board is split, um, a majority of the shareholders. Um, and the final important plank is that except in cases of dishonesty or misappropriation of company assets, the shareholders acting by a majority can ratify breaches of duty by directors. So they can decide not to pursue a claim and that decision, that ratification will be binding on the minority. Now, the consequence is obvious 
um, only the company can bring a claim against directors. Um, the court won't normally intervene to second guess that decision. So where the board or the, and or the company are under the control of wrongdoers, they can prevent action being taken against them. So to prevent the obvious injustices that that rule can give rise to, the common law courts developed a number of exceptions to the rule. Uh, and the most important one that I'm going to look at is sometimes called the fraud on the minority. Um, and, and to meet this problem, the courts devised a remedy under which the minority shareholder could bring a claim in the name of and on behalf of the company. The shareholder's entitlement to sue is derived from the company's right, hence derivative claim. Um, the scope of the common law exception, however, is fairly limited. First of all, the wrongdoing has to be in the nature of fraud or a breach of fiduciary duty which benefits the directors personally at the expense of the company. So importantly, claims for negligent mismanagement are excluded. The breaches have to be breaches that are not capable of being ratified by a majority of shareholders. And there has to be wrongdoer control so that the company can't or won't bring the claim itself. And, and finally, the claim has to be being brought bona fide for the benefit of the company, not for the shareholder's own benefit, not for some ulterior motive, such as to pursue some campaign against another shareholder. Um, and there has to be no other alternative remedy available. Um, but one point it's worth making is that because the rationale for the exception is to provide a remedy and prevent injustice, the exception does permit a shareholder in a holding company, um, so that's a company above the operating company, uh, to bring a claim. And so that's what is sometimes referred to as a double derivative claim or even a multiple derivative claim, depending on how many corporate layers there are between the shareholder who wants to bring the claim and the operating company. The next important feature of a derivative claim is that the courts have imposed a number of procedural restrictions um, on when they can be pursued. Um, in the DIFC, at rules uh, 20.63 to 20.69, it's CPR 19.9 in England. And the two key ones, it seems to me, are that the court has to give permission for the claim to be brought as a derivative claim. The onus is on the shareholder, therefore, to establish a prima facie case um, that the, there is an exception to the rule. And one of the ways that the court looks at that is to ask whether a hypothetical, reasonable, independent board could consider that the litigation was in the interests of the company. The other important procedural point is that the company has to be made a defendant because, of course, the claim is brought in the name of and on behalf of the company. And any compensation that's recovered, therefore, goes to the company, not to the shareholder claimant. So you have you have a tripartite claim. Um, you also, of course, have a disincentive, because why would a shareholder um, bother to bring this claim when any recovery will go into the company and therefore be diluted by the corporate layer and by the shareholdings um, above it? Um, to meet that, the corollary of the position is that under the court rules, where a claimant is given permission to bring a derivative claim, the court will usually order the company to indemnify the claimant against the costs incurred. Now, these special features of the derivative claim gives rise to some interesting questions about their arbitrability. The first one, it seems to me, is can they be arbitrated at all? Um, a number of jurisdictions, including England, Singapore, um, Hong Kong have put the derivative claim on a statutory basis and sometimes with significant differences from the common law claim. In some, some countries, the BVI, I think, is one example, the statutory jurisdiction has expressly replaced the common law claim. So if it's a statutory claim, does pub public policy mean that only the court has jurisdiction? Or is that trumped by party autonomy if you have an arbitration agreement between the shareholders? Um, this is something that Arshad um, has already touched on. Um, the second question, it seems to me, is assuming that you could arbitrate the claim, how do the characteristics of a derivative claim fit into the arbitration framework? And in particular, 
what's the role of the filter for permission? Is that simply a procedural step or is it something more substantive going to the claimant standing to bring the claims, which is certainly what's been suggested by the English case law, um, such as the Nova Trust and Care Investments case. Um, and if it is uh, a substantive step, how does that work in arbitration? Um, and I'm now going to hand over to Edward, who's going to look at the arbitration angle uh, for derivative claims. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, over the next few minutes, I'm going to look um, very quickly at three principal questions in relation to arbitration of derivative claims. The first is, um, and was touched on earlier by Arshad, um, is whether derivative claims are arbitrable. Um, the second is the procedure that's to be adopted um, in relation to the uh, derivative claim. A and the third is whether a decision on permission to uh, bring a derivative claim amounts to an award or is merely a procedural order for the purposes of a challenge. Um, in order to get through it that quickly, I'm going to have to gloss over rather the conceptual challenges and difficulties underlying some of these points uh, and look principally at the direction of travel um, so with that in mind, looking first at whether derivative claims are arbitrable. Of course, the, the issues are really going to arise in uh, where, where the applicable law is the common law, because that is where derivative claims are necessary. Um, there's no decision, somewhat surprisingly, there's no decision directly on the arbitrability of derivative claims. Um, I suspect that is partly because derivative claims are far less common than the noise that is generated about them um, in a world full of unfair prejudice petitions, which most people prefer. Uh, and, and secondly, because I suspect that people are comparatively sensible about it when it comes to it, uh, because the, the answer is a great deal more obvious than uh, the route to get there. Um, anyway, the reasoning in Fulham Football Club is, is almost certainly applicable to arbitration. Um, there are no public policy reasons why um, the court's jurisdiction shouldn't be um, essentially usurped by a tribunal um, and the available relief is not going to affect the parties. That there's no equivalent to any winding up in the relief available. So in principle, yes, um, arbitration is available. Um, the second issue we have to look at is whether um, all the parties are covered by the arbitration agreement. And, and this is a matter of some difficulty because, of course, derivative actions are founded upon um, claims by minority shareholders against directors. Um, obviously, uh, particularly out in, in jurisdictions out in the Middle East, um, it often arises in the context of a joint venture and the arbitration agreement will inevitably be contained in a shareholders agreement, um, possibly in the articles of the company as well. Um, directors are not usually parties to shareholder agreements, and they certainly aren't to the Articles of Association. Um, it is possible that um, shareholders may also act as directors, um, and that will be a matter of construction of the arbitration agreement. Um, it's going to be less usual in, in significant joint ventures where corporate structures are generally used for the, uh, for the shareholdings. Um, however, that's, that's not to say that um, the matter ends there with the directors. Um, there are often um, claims surrounding the action based, the action um, against the directors, and there's plenty of room for claims in relation to accessory liability of the majority shareholder, um, allegations of conspiracy, or particularly with breaches of fiduciary duty in dishonest assistance and knowing receipt. Um, there is, of course, uh, worth bearing in mind, a disadvantage for the minority shareholder of the applicability of the arbitration agreement, because it may well be left fighting on two fronts. It's going to have to pursue the directors in court and, and pursue similar proceedings in arbitration against the shareholders, which can be extremely expensive for both sides. Um, but the directors are unlikely to agree to the arbitration if it brings them in there. Um, so be very careful about who is going to be a party. Um, we then come to what procedure 
is going to be adopted. Um, the issue is difficult um, inter intellectually and conceptually. Um, in the end, um, it is unlikely to matter because all common law jurisdictions have such similar rules as to the procedure and the way to get around um, Foss and Harbottle. Um, that is not to say there aren't small differences, but in the end it's likely to be small. Um, the real problem arises out of the rule in Foss and Harbottle being a matter of substantive law, and it's going to fall within the applicable law of the arbitration. Um, to get around the rule, as Liz has said, um, the prospective claimant, the minority shareholder, uh, has to obtain permission to bring the claim in the name of the company. That doesn't vest the cause of action in them. They are simply uh, using a device um, to pursue the company's cause of action. And it appears that this the substantive rule in F Foss and Harbottle is being met by a procedural rule. Um, and, and one can then look at um, the nature of the test, it's simply a prima facie test with, with the other um, elements that Liz described in relation to whether it would, would be brought by the company, etc. Um, the common law authorities do routinely refer to the exception to the rule in Foss and Harbottle as a procedural device, um, going right back to Wallersteiner and Moore. Um, in the DIFC, um, it is the the application permission is entirely contained in the rules of court, um, in the uh, rules of the Dubai court, um, rule 20.63 onwards. Um, though it, it is fair to say that now in England, the Companies Act contains the permission requirements um, in the primary statute. Um, but it's certainly not something that is going to appear in any arbitral rules. So the question is, is it sufficiently um, procedural uh, that you're going to apply the procedural law of the arbitration or procedural rules of the arbitration instead, as opposed to using the um, applicable law to the main proceedings? Um, that does seem somewhat absurd um, to, to insist on one rule under one law to be met and then refused that law's um, remedy against it. Um, it, it's worth saying that the great expert on conflict of laws, um, Mr Justice Lawrence Collins, as he then was acknowledged in Rolls-Royce Industrial Power, um, that for purely domestic purposes, the exceptions to the rule have been regarded as procedural. I do not consider that in the international context, by which he meant the conflict of law context, their real nature is procedural. Um, now, I am not going to pretend to um, decide to to resolve this issue this afternoon, but I, I am pretty sure that um, the tribunals and courts will apply the same law to the exception uh, as they do to the rule itself. Um, there is then the small, the, the further issue of what actual procedure do you use for permission? Um, do you need to have, in, in particular, a preliminary issue as to whether permission will be granted. Um, that I'm afraid is even less clear. Um, it's much easier to characterise that stage of things as a purely procedural issue. Um, in ZCCM and Kansanchi Mining, in which Michael and I appeared, um, in the case of a Zambian company uh, governed by Zambian law, which was essentially the common law principles, um, the parties um, simply agreed to use the common law procedure. Um, in, in fact, we were unable to find any example of a derivative claim ever having been pursued under Zambian law um, or in the Zambian courts, but um, we simply thought it was appropriate to use the common law procedure, and that's for very good reason. Um, as set out originally in Wallersteiner and Moore, it can't be right to subject the parties to the entire trial of the issue only to find out whether the prospective claimant was entitled to a trial of the entire issue. Um, and I can't see much difficulty in persuading many tribunals that the issue should be dealt with as a preliminary issue if the parties are in dispute over whether it should be. Um, the final question is whether the nature of the decision on permission is an award or merely a procedural order. 
Um, notwithstanding what uh, Miss Justice Lawrence Collins had to say about it, in um, ZCCM, Michael and I were successful in persuading Mrs Justice Cockrell that um, the domestic um, description of the of the matter as procedural was um, of the issue as procedural um, prevailed. Um, she, she considered that ultimately um, it was a procedural matter and that the decision couldn't be truly final um, because it didn't affect the company's rights itself to pursue the issue, um, only the uh, shareholders rights to pursue it on the company's behalf uh, and on that basis it was a procedural matter. Um, I should say that it was partly um, owing to the tribunal um, ostentatiously calling the decision on permission a ruling um, and not an award or a procedural order. Um, they did subsequently um, publish an award dismissing the claim entirely and it may may have been that at that stage um, a challenge as to an award would have been appropriate but luckily Mr Justice Cockrell had so many different ways of um, getting rid of the challenge that it wasn't pursued at that stage. Um, we never found out. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Edward and Elizabeth. Um, we are, I'm afraid, just falling slightly behind, so we may have to just move on to the next um, speaker without any further questions. I certainly had a couple. I should have mentioned that there was a question to the panel from one of the attendees, and thank you very much for that. If we've got time, we'll pick it up at the end. If we don't, do send me an email because I've seen a case about it. The question was, um, how, how do tribunals tend to respond to situations where the court has decided something that, that that should normally be the subject of the jurisdiction of the tribunal but um we'll pick it up if we can but thank you very much um edward and elizabeth um we should make a move there and, and uh hear from our, our final speaker who is uh, matthew watson um matthew practices uh, broadly in commercial uh, disputes uh, but he focuses to a large extent on the middle east and in particular on the uae uh, he, he, he appears quite a lot in the DIFC courts and also uh, in arbitrations in, in Dubai, um, at, including in the DIFC, but also under DIAC rules. Uh, he uh, helped me quite a lot because he contributed to the recent book that we published on DIFC courts practice. And I've also worked with him on, on many occasions uh, in a number of cases, including quite recently uh, a fairly substantial dispute. Um, about a debt restructuring that, that, that went wrong. Um, but we also appeared quite recently together in an arbitration in the DIFC, uh, which at its earliest stages um, generated uh, the first anti-suit uh, that the DIFC courts had, had issued back in 2017. Uh, Matthew is going to tell us some things about relief and enforcement uh, of arbitration awards in the context of company law disputes. Matthew. Thanks, Tom. Um, I'm going to, as Tom uh, said, talk a little bit about uh, the sort of remedies that you might get uh, and enforcement. I think there are there are four broad categories of remedy that you might get from the court in a company dispute. Uh, you can get orders for compensation, orders regulating the company's business and those involved in it, uh, orders amending public records and registers, and finally orders that might bring companies to an end. I'm going to consider very briefly and broadly the issues about seeking this sort of relief from a tribunal and enforcing any uh, resulting award. Um, as Arshad indicated right at the start of um, these sets of talks, there's quite some overlap between questions of relief and questions of arbitrability. And also in many cases it might turn on the, the specific arbitration agreement about what powers uh, the tribunal have been granted. Uh, the ultimate message, which I think is the takeaway from, from my bit of the talk, is that where you're a party to a company dispute and, and you are bound by an arbitration clause, you need to plan quite carefully the nature of the remedy that you're going to seek and how it will be enforced from the very outset. Um, now, compensation claims uh, are relatively straightforward. They could be for breach of a duty owed to the company by its officers or breach of some obligations owed in a shareholders agreement that cause loss. Um, as, as all the other speakers have covered, a lot of the problems with those sort of claims tend to be questions of standing or whether um, derivative claims can be brought, whether the right parties are convened to the arbitration proceedings. If you've overcome all those problems, questions of relief and enforcement are going to be quite straightforward. 
tribunals can make um, monetary awards, they can be forced in the usual way. And I don't need to tell this audience about all the um, advantages and disadvantages of enforcing awards uh, in the UAE. Um, orders regulating the company's business are a little more tricky. Um, these are the sort of remedies that are usually granted to relieve unfair prejudice. They're commonly framed as, as follows, either orders requiring a person to do something or to stop doing something, orders regulating the conduct of the company's affairs, orders authorising proceedings in the name of the company, that's essentially a derivative action, uh, or, or the compulsory purchase of member shares by other members uh, or the company. That's the list that's given in Article 149 of the DIFC Companies Law. You also see that replicated in uh, Section 860 of the ADGM uh, Companies Regulation. It's not just, of course, common law courts. There are um, other Dubai free zones that are sort of modelled on the common law setup. So if you look at the Dubai Creative Clusters, their private companies regulation 2016, Regulation 89, effectively re replicates the remedies for unfair prejudice. And of course, you also have Article 164 of the Commercial Companies Law, where provided a member holds uh, at least 5% of the shareholding, they can complain, quote, if the affairs of the company are or have been conducted to the detriment of the interests of all or any of the shareholders, which to a common lawyer certainly looks a lot like unfair prejudice that we are all very used to. Um, apart from orders that are authorising proceedings in the company's name that Liz and Ed have talked about, um, all of those remedies that I've, I've set out are largely injunctive in nature. They're orders requiring someone to do something or requiring the company to take some sort of step like convene a meeting or to require a member to sell his shares or to buy shares at a certain price. Now on its face, why should that cause a problem for a tribunal, provided the relevant parties are joined so that any award is binding? Um, there's nothing unusual about tribunals commonly having uh, the power to award, to, to award effectively an injunction by way of final relief. And of course, as company lawyers, we often think about remedies for unfair prejudice being share buyouts, but they're not the only sorts of remedy that you might want to seek. And indeed, um, Fulham Football Club, which is the famous English decision about the arbitrability of company disputes, um, which uh, has been covered a lot in all the, the talks, that was in fact uh, to seek an order removing the chairman of Fulham Football Club for having interfered in the transfer of Peter Crouch between Tottenham and Portsmouth Football Clubs. There was no, no question of any shares being sold or the company being wound up. And there's no, provided the company is convened to the arbitration, no conceptual difficulty in my view, in a tribunal granting that sort of uh, relief. But even consider a, a share buyout, provided um, all the members are joined to the arbitration, which you know they might be if the arbitration agreement is in the articles or a shareholders agreement, um, the tribunal can direct a sale between the members by ordering some of them uh, to pay money and the others uh, to take the necessary steps to transfer the shares. Now, for an arbitral tribunal, you might have to approach that in stages. Uh, a determination of the buyout in principle and then hear evidence and a determination on the value of the shares and the timing of the uh, share sale um, but um, all of the or certainly a lot of the um, arbitral rules in the region whether that's LCIA, ICC or DIAC have provisions that permit interim or partial awards so there's no again conceptual problem in a tribunal deciding a, 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 um, a share buyout in a series of stages the real question, of course, is going to be enforcement. It's one thing having a paper award. It's another thing converting that uh, into action in the face of a party that doesn't wish to comply. How, for instance, uh, can you enforce an award um, where there's a share buyout if the putative seller refuses to sell? Um, if one starts by looking at what a court would do, it's here that the, port, the court, and, and, and we're really talking about the court of the place of incorporation, its power to control registers becomes um, very important because substantive relief in company disputes is often granted by requiring amendments to registers, um, by ordering, for instance, that a member's name be removed or added to the register of members. And um, these are a difficult category for tribunals. If one looks across the UAE, um, the power to rectify uh, registers and records are often vested in courts. So you've got Article 49 of the DIC Companies Law, that's control of the register of members. Uh, Section 794 of the ADGM 
companies regulations that's who's a who's registered as a charge or debenture holder you've also got article 220 of the uae uh, commercial companies law giving the court power over um, the records there um, in some instances in the free zones and here again the dubai creative clusters is a good example the power to determine disputes about who's uh, to be added or removed from a register is is vested in the registrar see uh, regulation 19 of those um, of those regulations. Now, I don't think it's impossible to achieve the same result in the context of an arbitration. And I think there are two possible routes, although it's fair to say there's there's very little guidance in the authorities. Um, the first is that uh, if you've got the company as party to the arbitration, well, the company is generally responsible for making changes to the public registers. So the tribunal can always make an order against the company requiring it to take the necessary steps to amend the register. And then what you've got is an injunctive award, which you can uh, seek to enforce against the company through the courts. The other, is, as Arshad indicated when he was answering Michael's question at the beginning, is that um, most tribunals have the power to make a declaratory award. And so it's possible for the tribunal to declare that the register should be changed, i.e. that a particular individual ought to be entered as a member, and then to enforce the declaratory award by obtaining a judgment in its terms, and then seek a court order amending um, the registered or the relevant uh, register, with the award having made the issue, the substantive issue between the parties um, res judicata. Um, and it's all well and good getting an award, but what about enforcement between um, the particular courts and might there be a divergence of approach between the local and common law courts in the UAE? Well, I'm aware of one decision, the Dubai Court of Cassation's decision, I think it's 150 of 2014, where an arbitration award was set aside on public policy grounds. And that was an award dealing with the, the, the claimant shareholders' rights in a share buyout. And the Dubai uh, Court of Cassation held that the relief that had been granted was outside the jurisdiction of the tribunal. Now, that, that could be seen as a decision on arbitrability or a decision about the sort of remedies that um, arbitrators can have. Um, but that's only one example from, from the UAE, and I've had experience in a, in a recent decision um, in the DIC courts of being able to get an order there and take it to registrars in the free zone who've often been willing to amend registers uh, in accordance with DIC court orders, declaring that a particular party is entitled to be uh, entered uh, as a member on the register. So it's not necessarily the case that the um, civil courts in the UAE will speak with one voice. And of course, as um, many of the speakers have highlighted, the common law courts don't also necessarily speak with one voice on this issue either. Ultimately, I think the relief is going to have to be crafted depending on the ultimate jurisdiction where the register is based. And this is, the, this is why um, strategic planning at the outset of any proceedings is going to be very important. Now, just touching uh, very briefly at the end on terminating companies, I think this is an area where tribunals really will struggle. Uh, insolvency is very much a field that's, that's going to be reserved to a court. Um, the DIFC court obviously has the power to wind up a company if it's just and equitable. Um, that's in the insolvency law. There are similar provisions in the ADGM, and there are some similar provisions in some of the other free zones. Um, I think there's no reason in principle why a tribunal can't make a declarative award uh, holding that it's just and equitable that a company be wound up. And then as the English court posited in Fulham, the tribunal could expressly authorise a party to apply to the court for winding up. And that's the English view. Um, I'm, I think there are some decisions in the Cayman Islands that have, have queried whether um, those, whether the tribunal can go that far, or whether the ultimate discretion is still not very much reserved to the court. Um, but it's certainly at least a line of argument um, for thinking about. So I think to summarise, it's not impossible to achieve effective remedies in corporate disputes through arbitration, but the limitations uh, on tribunals is something that parties are going to have to grapple with before you commence proceedings, because um, strategic questions are going to arise about the nature of the relief that can be sought and where it can be enforced. And that's obviously particularly true uh, here in the Middle East where there are a number of different courts that have, as you all know, strengths and weaknesses for litigants uh, with arbitral awards. Um, thank you, Tom. Thank you very much, Matthew. You know, that's really, um, it's interesting. It's an issue, that, these are issues that come up again and again and again, but the thing that occurs to me 
um, to put it neutrally, is to say, well, you know, you've been talking about quite a lot of these difficulties, or at least uncertainties that arise in relation to the arbitration of these kinds of disputes. I mean, is it actually is it actually worth including arbitration agreements in your shareholders agreement in your articles of association, or are you just inviting trouble? I think it's a very interesting question. I mean, when you get a group of barristers together to talk about the uh, arbitrability of, of in, in the broad sense of company disputes, it's very easy for all of us to focus on the difficulties that our clients might have and then to stand back from the end of that and think, well, why bother with arbitration? And yet all the time I see in shareholders agreements uh, and in art articles of association, um, arbitration uh, agreements. Um, I think there probably is still value um, um, probably the principal value of arbitration is that it can be conducted confidential, uh, confidentially. I, I think of a case um, that I was asked to consider only very recently arising out of Dubai, where the issue was um, whether shareholders were obliged because of what had happened under COVID um, to um, uh, pump funds into the company under their shareholders agreement. Now, I can quite understand why the members of a company might want to have a dispute about whether they need to inject capital or not. Uh, conducted in a private arbitration rather than being open to the world and whatever market their company is involved in. So I think notwithstanding uh, all of these disputes, there's still, uh, and all of these problems uh, that arbitration of company uh, questions might bring, I think there's probably still quite a lot of commercial value in an arbitration agreement. Yes, yes, and I, I, I certainly agree with that. Well, look, I think that brings us to the end uh, of our programme. Uh, so that just leaves it to me to, to thank everybody, to thank in particular our contributors uh, for some excellent insights and for shedding some light on, on some of these, uh, I think, really interesting issues and, and some of them quite difficult areas. Uh, and of course, thank you uh, for, for, for joining us for this. And we hope that you find uh, this valuable. Um, I should have said uh, a recording of this should be available shortly. Um, so if you or any of your colleagues want to go back and uh, look at it, uh, then it should be available on our website. But um, thank you all again. And, and, and all I would say is that we hope that we see you in person uh, in the not too distant future. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye.